Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Joel. I am the lead pastor. I, I just love uh, so many of our um, um, just amazing teams we have around here. Uh, our jam team that was just a few weeks ago, they were just like, we're not going to we're not going to take not involving the kids. We're going to find a way to involve the kids. We started doing that. I love it. It's incredible. We have a setup crew that gets here. Uh, it, it's a warm day today. It got warm kind of early, but they were already here setting up. And we had a group of guys come in this week and started working on this incredible structure. Uh, which is amazing, and yeah, it's okay to get excited about that. That's amazing looking. Not done yet. It's got a roof. It's got to get on. It's got to get painted. The stage becomes a little more uh, solid, and uh, but still, I mean, it's it's moving in the right direction. And so we're going to have this amazing space out here. We've been talking about it for years. Well, we finally had a good excuse. But so glad you're here today for joining us online. Thank you so much for being with us. For those of you out in our drive-in, our tune-in section, hello. Thanks for being here. And uh, we're just so excited that all of you are here today, whether you're out here and you're getting a little work on your tan and getting a little heat tolerance, or whether you're at home uh, with a nice cold glass of orange juice, uh, don't rub it in. And uh, we had ours earlier. I want to talk a little bit today about uh, what happens when you get too much of a good thing. Uh, what happens when you get too much of a good thing? You know, it, it, nothing's wrong with having a good work ethic. Nothing is wrong with working hard and, and seeing something through and not giving up. Nothing's wrong with that. But then what happens when you get too much of that? What happens when you get too much work? What happens when you push yourself too hard? What happens when you cross the line from having a good work ethic to being a workaholic? Now, the interesting thing with workaholics, we're never going to admit that we're workaholics. We're not gonna, we just don't say that about ourselves. Others will. We won't say it about us. So to help bridge that gap, I, I did a little research on what are just some warning signs. What are some warning signs of being workaholic? And here are 10 warning signs that you, we might be teetering a little too close to being a workaholic. Uh, the first one is uh, we're the first to arrive in the office and the last to leave. The second one, do you tend to work through your lunch hour? Virtually every lunch hour. Do you have any real hobbies? Do you do anything for fun? Just fun. Uh, number four, do you get stressed when you're not at work? You could be a workaholic. Number five, do you devalue personal priorities? Meaning, do you look funny at coworkers because they take their vacation time? Or uh, back before all the current uh, craziness, uh, did you look funny at people because they actually caught in sick? I mean, it's pretty normal for most of us to go to work sick until, you know, since March, and then we didn't. But I mean, before that, that was pretty normal that people would come to work sick. Do, but do you devalue that? Do you look down on other people because they do that? Number seven, do you, uh, excuse me, number six, do you take any real vacations? If you're checking email and returning phone calls on vacation, you're not really taking a vacation. But do you take any real vacations? Number seven, is your mind at work even when you are not? Is your mind at work when you are not? Number eight, do you feel well? Do you feel well? Psychiatrists tell us that many times with any addiction, whether it's work or substance abuse, that we tend to have physiological responses to that. We tend to get headaches, gastrointestinal problems, migraines even. We could have a compromised immune system, heart issues. Our body responds to the stress that we are constantly putting ourselves under. Do you feel well? Are you too accessible? Does everybody know you're just a phone call away? Are you too accessible? You might be suffering from workaholism. Number 10, probably the one that gets most of us. Are you hiding work from your loved ones? Are you hiding your work from your loved ones? I mean, you're doing it on the side when you think no one's watching you. You could have it. Now, workaholism has a lot of jokes associated with it. Like a lot of things, we tend to make light of it. That's how we cope with it. But the difficulty is in our society, we value that. We actually hold that up as a virtue. I mean, after all, who gets the praises and the raises? The workaholics. The people that work a little bit longer, a little bit harder. The ones who stay a little bit later. The ones who take on the extra job. The ones who never say no. That's who gets the praises. That's who gets the raises. That's who society rewards. And it's not just an American thing. It is certainly an American thing. But most cultures post-World War II 
that are based uh, primarily on economics and their economies, they tend to value work to such a high degree that we actually have words to describe when we work too much. Now, the Japanese have a word for it, and their word for it is karoshi. It means overworked death, to, to essentially kill yourself with work. In America, we call it burnout. But whatever you call it in any language, it's the same thing. It's working yourself to the point that it's not healthy anymore. What if you really can gain the whole world, but you lose your family? You lose your friends. You lose yourself. You lose your soul. Is it really worth it? I mean, in the end, is it really worth it? That's what we're talking about today in part three of our message series, Don't Waste Your Work. It's a warning to workaholics. You heard the scripture passage already from Luke chapter 12. We're going to go through it again, verses 13 through 21. But, you know, this is a very personal message to me. Because I am someone who can tell you what happens when you work yourself to the point that you begin writing emotional checks that your, your body cannot cash. And when you overdraw that account, well, you're going to hear about that in a few minutes. But Jesus is, is having this interaction here in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. And again, here's the passage. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, teacher tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant crop, an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Now, there are several warnings in this parable, several warnings we can get out of this. But one of them that I want you to see is that workaholism is a distortion of the biblical call to work. We are called to work. We are created to do stuff. We're not created to sit back and do nothing. We're created to do things. But when we take that too far, it can be very detrimental to us. You look at the passage, Jesus doesn't criticize the man's work ethic. He was driven by success. He was driven by working hard. He was not lazy. He was clearly industrious. He had done the right things within his power to produce a great crop. He had the, the money saved up to build a bigger barn when he had a surplus. And, and so when God blessed the ground and it produced more, he had the resources to take care of it. That was not the problem. That's not, I look through this passage and Jesus never in the story criticizes this man's work ethic. He never says, oh, he, he, he didn't save enough money or he didn't, he, that's not at all what he said. Instead, what he says is that if the sum of our life is our work, then we are fools. If all we are is what we do, then we have traded everything. We have traded what work really is. As a t-shirt I saw a few years ago said, he or she who dies with the most toys still dies. We're not going to take into the next life what we have in this life. So that's the first warning that workaholism is a distortion of the biblical call to work. But that's not all we have a warning for. We also have the warning that finding our identity in what we do is a distortion of our humanity. It's a distortion of what humanity is meant to be and who we are. I mean, think about the average introduction. I meet a lot of people in what I do, and I know uh, probably many of you cross paths with other people and people you don't know, and you meet them, you say hello, you, you chit-chat a little bit, and inevitably, what does the conversation turn to? So, 
what do you do? You ever thought about why that question matters? Who cares? I mean, for me, I have to admit, it gets a little awkward because the second I say I'm a pastor, people start acting like I'm Jesus and they start trying to confess to me and it gets really strange. And I'm like, relax, I'm just a guy. Jesus loves you and I do too, but this, you know, it's weird. But besides for that, why does it matter? See, it matters because, again, in our culture, we place different value on people depending on what they do. Don't people react differently when they meet a doctor or a lawyer, a judge, attorney, maybe even a pastor? Would you feel the same way if they said that they were a handyman or a custodian or a plumber or an electrician, farmer, teacher? Why does it matter? Because in most societies that base their society and their value off economics, that's how we determine pecking order. It's how we determine our class. Now, I know you see me saying, well, I don't quite get what you're saying with that. What I'm saying is when we do this, what Jesus is describing here, we are undermining the very fact that we are created in the image of God. Listen to this. We are created in the image of God, which means... Every human being has intrinsic value because they are human. Which means we should not treat the CEO and the janitor with the same respect. We should treat all people with the same respect because they all bear the image of God. If we're human and if we claim to be Christian, then we have to treat them all with respect because they equally have value in the eyes of God. Jesus died for all of us. Not just a part of us, not just the wealthy part or the poor part. He died for every one of us. But our workaholism distorts that and it begins to place a value on the fact that I work harder so I must be more valuable. You know, one of the, one of the discouraging things that came right at the beginning of March and April is this whole idea of essential. As if suddenly some of you are not essential. If you notice, we've kind of changed the terminology in our culture a little bit. I'm thankful because we have to because everyone is essential. Everyone's ability to work and to make a a living and to pay their bills, that is essential. But when we now define ourselves by what we do, we actually are dehumanizing ourselves. And we're dehumanizing each other. Because it is too easy to let a good thing become unhealthy. Because there's nothing wrong with work. If you tend to be towards the lazy side, you're probably looking at this going, man, I got it made. I'm good. That's a different message. We already talked about that. (laughs) Message number one, redeem work. Go back and listen to that one. But it's easy to let something that is good become unhealthy. I was in my upper 20s. I am not in my upper 20s now. I can assure you I feel it every morning. But when I was in my upper 20s, I found myself uh, the worship pastor at a very large church. And I went from there to uh, being executive associate. And then from there, I went to be lead pastor in another church. And I was the youngest lead pastor they'd ever had. I think I was in my mid-30s by that point. Now, how did I get there? Because I simply worked harder than everybody else. I wasn't better than them. I just worked harder than everybody else. I'd burn the candle at both ends. If I couldn't get it done, I'd just put in a little more work and eventually I'd get it done. So if I ran up against something that was bigger than me, I just worked a little bit harder and it always had worked. It had always worked that if I just pushed myself a little bit further, I could get past that mountain and then I could, you know, I could then pull back to a better pattern. But then what happens is eventually that becomes its own drug and you start working harder and you get more results and, and then you start working harder and you get more results and you work harder and you get more results. And guess who got the praises and the raises? Me. So guess what I did? I just worked harder and longer and faster and better and I just did more and more and I kept getting the praises and the raises and then God pulls a fast one on us. God comes up and he, he calls my wife and I and kids to, to move from California to Southeast Louisiana to plant a church. Now, long story how it was Southeast Louisiana. Don't get caught up on that. Get caught up on the fact that God did this and we said, this is crazy. And so other people in our lives affirmed this and just said, yes, God is doing this. God opened every door for us to get there. We move, we get there, and I just ran the same play that I'd kept running. Work harder, faster, longer, better. Just if it didn't work, work a little harder. Just keep pushing and keep pushing and keep driving and keep driving. And eventually you'd win. And I just did that. And I did that over and over. And I kept pushing and I kept pushing. And I stopped taking my days off because I needed more work. 
I had to get more done because it wasn't happening. And so I just pushed harder, and I kept going, and I kept going, and I'm running seven days a week after this thing, and finally I'm running 30-something days straight on this. I'm running 60-something days straight. I'm running 90-something days straight, 120 days straight. I am a year and a half pushing, 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 and it fails miserably. But everything I thought I was was bound up in that. And I watched it crumble. And no matter how much I worked, no matter how hard I tried, every play that I had ever done that had worked every other time failed. It's like, it's like my very work. It's, like, it's almost like God himself just turned it all against me. Let me tell you, when your identity is bound up in what you fail at, you don't have to be a genius to figure out how you start to feel about yourself and what you begin to see in the mirror when your work begins to betray you. And, and I'll spare you the details, but in the middle of that frustration, when I'm looking around going, well, gee, God, what now? None of that worked. Everything that worked that got me here suddenly stopped working. In the middle of that frustration and fear and failure and doubt and uncertainty, I was so angry and I was so upset and I was so frustrated and so burned out and fried to a crisp, fried, done. I didn't even feel. Literally, y'all, I'm not exaggerating. Angels as my witness. I don't remember that part of my life. It's just gone from my memory. That's how much I just poured everything I had out until there was nothing left, and then I poured a little more. But in the middle of all that, God taught me a lesson. I, I fought it. I fought it to learn it. I really did. And for those of you who, are, who have been where I have been or, or are teetering really close to that, what I'm about to tell you is, is salve for your soul. It's not profound until you're ready to hear it. You know what I mean? It's one, what I'm about to tell you is one of those things that until you're, you're there, until you find yourself there, this isn't that profound. But, but I might be one of the first people, one of the first workaholics to tell you this. And here's what Jesus is telling us in Luke 12, 13 through 21. Your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. Your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. Consider what Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He writes, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. That means our old way of doing things, that old value system that, that pushes that kind of workaholism, that's the old way. The new way is here. As Christians, we live in a different way. We work and we work hard because, as we said in message number one, we work for the Lord. But the Lord doesn't lead us to burnout. The Lord doesn't lead us to not take Sabbath and to not rest. The Lord doesn't do that. We do that. that that's our sin doing that. That's not him. That's the old way. He leads us in the new way that's an abundant life and involves rest. Because your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. You know what that means? That means Jesus doesn't love you more when you're winning. And he doesn't love you less when you're losing. Let me rewind that and say it again. He doesn't love you more when you're winning, and he doesn't love you less when you're losing. As his child, he loves the wonderful, beautiful, quirky, creative person that he made you to be. He loves you the way you are. And he loves you enough to take you to heaven to be with him. That's why I say your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. After all, consider the alternative. If what we do defines how valuable we are, what happens when you can't work anymore? What happens when you're suddenly laid off? What happens when you fail at doing that and your work crumbles? What happens when you retire? If all you do is all you're worth, then you're worth nothing when there's no work. But that's not what the Bible says about you. The Bible says that your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. 
Consider this from Philippians chapter seven, uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. But whatever regains to me now, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. So, dear one, we need to gain perspective on workaholism. Because I promise you that just because you and I live differently as disciples of Jesus, the world isn't going to suddenly change and applaud that. They're not going to suddenly flip a switch and go, hey, man, good for you. Hey, girl, way to go. No, they won't. The change is in us. And when I went through that season that I described, I had to learn some things. One thing I learned is I, I made a goal every year to roll over as few vacation days as I can. Now, this year has been a little strange. I didn't take some of the vacations I tend to take. And usually for us, it's little small trips here or there. We go to the mountains. We go to the beach. Well, all that kind of changed in 2020. So I've got a few more days banked up than I need to right now. And our office manager, Luana, is always after me, reminding me, you need to take vacation. You need to take vacation. Why does she do that? Because I ask her to hold me accountable for it. Because I know if I don't do it, I'll just roll it over and I won't take it. That's my tendency. That's my nature. Also, what I did through the, after that season, I developed hobbies. I never really had hobbies before that weren't related to my work. Now I have hobbies that have nothing to do with my day job. Two of my hobbies, uh, and I talk about them both a lot, actually. One of them is um, I like to make Christmas lights go blinky flashy to music. It is the most unimportant hobby in the world. doesn't change a thing, but it makes me happy. That's my hobby. Second one is I like to be outside, I like to be out in the sun, and I like to, to grill and barbecue and smoke meats. And I mean, if, if it's not raining, the barbecue's on on the weekends. Now, that doesn't make any difference. It's a lot of trouble. And as, it's not even all that important. But it's my hobby. It makes me happy. It actually makes me more effective here because there's, time that I, there's times that I unplug and I recharge so that I can come here and I can now give. Because I've been, ref I've been refreshed. So if you're teetering on that edge of workaholism or if you are there, take it from another workaholic. Take a break. Schedule your vacation time today. Turn it in tomorrow. Get it done. Schedule that time to go do something. Say, Joel, I can't afford to do that. Fine, stay home. Use the vacation time. Yeah, they're going to look at you funny just like you used to look at them funny. That's okay. Let them look because you're in for the long haul. You're trying to make it all the way to retirement, not burn out before you get there. Take your vacation. If you control your own schedule, you really have no excuse. Set it and do it. Take a break. Second thing, second piece of advice from one workaholic to another. Get some hobbies. Do something that doesn't matter. Now, to workaholic, that is the most, like, frustrating thing to say, something that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, do something that doesn't matter. Get a hobby. Someone might say, Joel, I, I, I don't have time to take a hobby. That's why you need one. Because you think you don't have time for it. You think you're, you think you're so important that the whole opera is going to fall apart if you're not there. Get a hobby. Go do something fun. Make sure it has nothing to do with what you do for a living. Now, for all of us, workaholics, pre-workaholics, post-workaholics, burned out, every one of us, we need to really cultivate that personal worship time. We talk about that a lot around here because it's that important. You need to take those sips, sing, investigate, pray, stay. Just search our website for sips. You'll find all kinds of stuff for it. It's our recipe for that personal worship time to get in there with Jesus because you are not going to realize what you are worth until you spend time with the one that determines your worth. 
We talked about that in the first week with the pie graph, how much time we spend at work. And look, if Jesus doesn't get a cut of your day, if you're not spending time with him, the Holy Spirit is not filling your battery with the spiritual truth that he gives you your worth and not your work. You're just going to fall back into the same habits. Habits are very hard to break because oftentimes we try to break them through sheer willpower. Jesus wants to teach us a new way of living, and we're not going to get there apart from spending time. It's that important. Work is important. It's how we pay our bills. It's how we function as a society. We need all people in all different places in any functioning society to make it work. We need people at the white collar end and the blue collar end. We need everybody. But what you do doesn't define your worth. And if it does, that's a flashing red light to you of that rich fool that did everything right from a human point of view. But God looked at and said was a foolish person. Live their life for what they could get instead of what they could give. Live their life for themselves instead of God. That's the warning. So if you passed or failed that test at the beginning, just remember this. Your work does not define your worth. Jesus does. Let me pray for you as we prepare to sing our last song. Lord Jesus, for those of us who teeter on the edge of workaholism and struggle with that, God, that's, that's a hard message to believe really deep down. It's a hard message to feel down to our toes. It's something we'll nod with, but Lord, we, we struggle to really live like we accept it. It's hard to to embrace that you have determined our worth and not the place where we spend so much time. And God, we need your forgiveness where we have turned work into our God, where work has become our idol, where the mere pursuit of gain has become all we've lived for. And God, help us not to, uh, to, to be on the other side of that equation and say, well, just anyone who makes money must be greedy. Lord, that, that's, that's a cop-out. God, there are people at all ends of the spectrum that are workaholics, that work themselves to an early grave and define themselves by their work. So God, deal with us, deal with me, deal with my brothers and sisters individually. Remind us that you are calling us to repentance. You are calling us as individuals to turn back to you, to keep our work in its proper place, to let you define who we are. And God, as we sing this, this song, may we remember the truth of it, that it is not our work that is worthy, but it is you. It is to you that we live our lives. In Jesus' name.